who does Tanjiro end up with? And Zanitsu, and even Inosuke. Who does the Wind Hashira love? And who does Giyu love? All of those questions along with every other secret romance in Demon Slayer will be explained over the course of this video. So make sure to stay tuned for this one because it's going to be without a doubt my longest video ever. If you enjoy seeing detailed Demon Slayer videos like this one and want to keep them coming, channel the Hashira with it and slay that like button until you see flashy fireworks Tengen style. Join the Slayer fan by subscribing and hitting that notification bell to turn on all notifications so you don't miss future Demon Slayer videos and updates and you don't want that with the new season right around the corner. Set your heart ablaze and without further ado let's jump into it spoilers and all. Tanjiro x Kanao. Kanao debuts as early as chapter 6 believe it or not during the final selection exam. We just see her gentle smile and don't spend much time with her, but like Zainitsu and Genya, she was singled out, foreshadowing her future importance in the story. She was one of the almost 20 participants and one of the 5 to actually survive. So it wasn't really love at first sight here, since Kanao was just in the background as Tanjiro was carrying out his goal of trying to help save his sister. Let's fast forward now to the Nataguma mountain arc. At this point she came with Giyu and Shinobu as her Tsuguko, aka as her apprentice and eventual successor. Again, this wasn't very romantic meeting. Shinobu is trying to kill Nezuko because she's a demon while Tanjiro and Giyu are trying to protect Nezuko from the insect Hashira. As Giyu is keeping Shinobu busy, her assistant Kanao attacks Tanjiro as he's running away with Nezuko. She almost kills Nezuko, Tanjiro's precious sister, but Tanjiro manages to stop her. Kanao is a beast though and then manages to knock Tanjiro out with a kick to the head. As she chases down Nezuko, a part of her thinks it's weird that Nezuko is just running and not attacking, but another part of her says, and I quote, just kill demon like I was taught." End quote. At this point, she is clearly not allowing herself to think for herself, rather just following orders. Luckily, the crows let Kanao know that Nezuko is to be captured rather than killed, and then she proceeds with those new instructions. So yeah, not a conventional start to a romance. Imagine a girl knocked you out with a kick and tried to kill your sister. Still, arguably, Kanao was just doing what the majority of demon slayers would do, following orders and trying to eliminate demons. At the Butterfly Mansion, things really begin to change. While the Kakushi are carrying Tanjiro there, they see Kano and Tanjiro stares at her as if it's the first time he truly saw her, as she smiles surrounded by butterflies. It's explained to Tanjiro that she's a Tsuguko, a demon slayer who's being trained by a Hashira. Only the most talented and highly skilled fighters get selected, so she's very impressive. Tanjiro thinks that he saw her at final selection, but he didn't notice that she stepped on him last night, hilariously enough. While the Kakushi ask if they can enter, Kanao just smiles vacantly, not saying anything. Aoi then intercepts them and leads them away. But interestingly enough, Tanjiro stares back looking at Kanao, clearly showing his interest in this weird quiet girl who could also kick his butt. The butterfly girls including Kanao and Aoi help with their training. Tanjiro, being more straight laced, doesn't make a big deal of this fact, while Zainitsu freaks out when he finds out, saying, the girls have nice chests, great butts, and strong thighs. Tanjiro does his best not to give in to such thoughts, since as he says he thinks it's bad to train with such impure motivations. Kano was on another level and continually beat the three demon slaying amigos in the game of tag and in the cup throwing game. They marveled at her abilities and how even though she joined at the same time, she was so much ahead of them. Tanjiro was the opposite and actually lagged behind Zenitsu and Inosuke to the point where he felt embarrassed. Still, after losing to Kano, the unbeatable, for 5 days straight Zenitsu and Inosuke stopped showing up, but Tanjiro kept coming and working hard, and lost for another 10 days straight. Tanjiro wondered about why he couldn't beat her, and pointed out that she smelled closer to a Hashira and that her eyes were different. Finally, Tanjiro realizes that the difference is that he doesn't use total concentration breathing 24 hours a day, while the Hashira and Kano do. We find out that Kano can use breathing to burst huge hard gourds, and Tanjiro is shocked that a skinny girl like her can do it. Through hard work and total concentration breathing, Tanjiro manages to eventually catch Kano in tag and to beat her in the cup game, except he doesn't want to throw the smelly medical tea in her face, so he just sets the cup on her head, which still counts as a win. You gotta love these moments they have, and even though Tanjiro did beat her here, Kano actually had more up her sleeve as we'll find out later. But the fact that these two are both such strong fighters also makes them a nice match in my books. A true power couple. Now let's fast forward to when Tanjiro thanks Kano for everything and is heading out again. Again, Kano smiles and remains quiet. There's an extended moment of silence before Kano finally takes out a coin and 
flips it. After seeing the result, it's hilarious how unintentionally cold and formal Kano's response is. She states, and I quote, I merely followed my teacher's instructions, so you don't need to thank me. Goodbye, end quote. No nice to spend time with you. No I like you. Not even a you're welcome. Nevertheless, Tanjiro is just shocked she spoke. Clearly, Tanjiro is drawn to Kanao even in these earlier parts of the story, since not a lot of people would stay so long considering Kanao's behavior. Kanao keeps repeating goodbye while Tanjiro keeps talking, asking her about what she threw and why she threw it. Then Kanao opens up and says, and I quote, I tossed this to decide things for which I haven't been told what to do. Just now, I decided whether I would speak to you or not. Heads meant I wouldn't and tails meant I would. It came up tails, so I spoke, end quote. Crazy to think if the end result would have changed if she got heads and didn't speak to Tanjiro, but with how persistent Tanjiro is, it may not have even mattered. As Kano says goodbye again for the thousandth time, Tanjiro keeps the conversation going, asking Kano why she can't decide for herself what to do. No response. He continues, and I quote, what did you want to do for yourself, end quote. Kano not saying goodbye, which is progress in and of itself, says, it doesn't matter, nothing matters at all, so I can't decide by myself. Tanjiro blows her mind and heart wide open when he says, and I quote, I think everything in this world matters, end quote. He goes on to tell her that he bets the voice in her heart is soft, but that it's also important to follow instructions. He borrows her coin and surprise surprise, she says yes, without flipping the coin. So Tanjiro has already started to get Kanao out of her robotic-like existence. He then throws the coin and says that this will decide if she listens closely to the voice in her heart from now on. If it's heads, she'll have to live by her heart. The usually calm and vacant Kanao is now wide awake and even sweating as she awaits the result. They both see his heads and Tanjiro is overjoyed and tells Kanao that she can do it. The heart is what drives us. Her heart can get infinitely stronger." End quote. It's like Kanao had been frozen in time in a sense and she just melted during this exchange and started to really live again. By the way, Tanjiro grabs the hands of the now nervous Kanao, another clue that they'd end up together. As Tanjiro rushes off saying goodbye, Kanao Kano is now full of energy and screaming after him. How did he know it would come up heads? Was Tanjiro really leaving this all to fate or chance? Kano wants to know if it was a valid throw. She thinks to herself that she was watching his hand and she doesn't think that he cheated. And this is one of my favorite parts in Demon Slayer right here. Tanjiro smiles and says, it was just chance, but here's the kicker, and I quote, besides, if it was tails, I was gonna flip it over and over until I got heads, end quote. Tanjiro was not going to leave this to chance. He was going to keep going until he made made sure that Kano started listening to her heart. He tells her to take care as she remains there holding the coin that Tanjiro had just held to her heart. When another girl catches her off guard, Kano straight up falls over, clearly flustered about her reawakening feelings. And after the scene between Tanjiro and Kano, no one should be surprised that they end up together. Tanjiro's consistent effort and interest in Kano, and the fact that Kano's heart was pretty much reawakened by him, is heavy foreshadowing for what's to come, so I don't want anyone saying that this matchup came from left field, since this significant and life-changing scene was in the very first season. However, there are arguably matchups that come from left field, and we'll get into those later. By the way, because of the nature of this video, I won't be focusing too much on Kano's backstory, although I do go into it in more detail in my How Strong Is Kano video. Long story short though, she had a difficult upbringing. She grew up in poverty and in an abusive home. She witnessed siblings pass away, and if she cried, she would get punished. Not surprisingly, she eventually broke psychologically, and was sold into slavery before Kanae and Shinobu saved her. Although they physically rescued her, she was like an empty shell, and Kanae had to give her a coin to flip before she could make any decision. Thus, Tanjiro straight up mends her broken psyche here, and although she will still grow from here, the wheels are clearly turning again, making Tanjiro already one of the most important figures in her life up to this point. Now we fast forward to Tanjiro waking up from his coma, after the fight against Upper Moons Gyutaro and Daki, who's the first person he sees none other than a concerned Kanao who straight up drops and breaks a vase when she sees. She's no longer the empty shell she once was. She reveals that he's been unconscious for two months. Clearly, she's been looking after him, and then she gives us one of the most heartwarming smiles, with what appear to be tears coming from her eyes, and she tells Tanjiro she's glad that he's awake. 
full ship ahead. It's a moment that's easy to gloss over if you're waiting to get to the fights, but it shows just how much Kanao has come to care about Tanjiro. The fact that she's the first to see him suggests that she, in all likelihood, spent the most time by his bed. Now, let's skip over to Kanao's fight against Upper Moon to Doma. The whole fight is amazing, but I'll try to focus on the details that stand out from a Tanjiro and Kanao perspective. The first thing I'll mention and go back to is how Kanao, like Tanjiro the Chosen One, is an amazing fighter in her own right, making them quite the power couple. Doma says that Kanao might just be a little more skillful than Shinobu, who he's just eaten, and that's before Kanao even shows him her full power. This is an important fight for Kanao because she is avenging both Kane and Shinobu, both of whom rescued her from slavery and died at the hands of Doma. By this point, Kanao is definitely not a vacant shell, she is burning with passion and specifically with hatred for Doma. Inosuke helps Kanao in this fight, as does Shinobu who poisoned Doma when he ate her, but Kanao is still amazing in it in her own right. She uses one of my favorite breath style techniques ever called Flower Breathing Final Form Vermilion Eye, which is pretty much like a Sharingan with its own unique spin. It makes surrounding movements look dull and slow and it causes pressure on the eyes that stains them red. Kanao uses this ability and with the help of Inosuke and Shinobu's poison succeeds in defeating Doma, finally carrying out her revenge. As a result of using this OP technique though, she loses vision in her right eye. After the battle we find out that Kanao couldn't cry for Kanae after she died, but everyone was kind and didn't think less of her because she couldn't show emotion. And finally she cries harder than ever, the floodgates open, symbolizing that with her defeat of Doma, she's fully regained her ability to show her emotions. Similarly, Tanjiro completes his revenge arc by finally beating Muzan with the help of everyone. And like Kanao, he loses vision in his right eye in the process. And although it's sad that they both lose their vision in one eye, it's yet another thing that, for us hardcore romantics, makes them seem destined for each other. But let's not gloss over this final battle because there are quite a few important moments concerning Kano and Tanjiro. There is a point where Muzan has taken out almost everyone, including the strongest Hashira, and Kano looks like the only fighter left. He approaches her and is about to finish her off, and Tanjiro swoops in with the save using the legendary Dance of the Fire God style and takes Kano away to safety. At this point, half of Tanjiro's face is mutated, but he doesn't seem to care. He just apologizes to Kano for being late and tells the Kakushi to take care of her. It's a complete 180 from the time Kano easily knocked him out with a kick, and you love to see it. However, it's not just Tanjiro doing the saving. Kano's turn comes up when Tanjiro becomes an overpowered demon. Kano still had some anti-demon medicine, and when she sees the state Tanjiro is in, she realizes that this is the reason she still has one eye left. Kanao, bless her heart, uses Vermilion Eye with her one remaining eye in order to save Tanjiro. She gets hurt in addition to hurting her last remaining eye with her special technique, but it doesn't bother her, as she says all she wishes for is for Tanjiro to come back to them, and you can noticeably see that her words reach him. Just as Tanjiro saved Kanao, Kanao was willing to risk not only her vision, but her life to save Tanjiro as well. And this is the big push which helps him return to the world of humans. As Tanjiro recovers, Kanao is laying down too, being treated for her injuries. They make eye contact and both smile and cry, having saved each other. During chapter 204, the second last chapter, Tanjiro and Kanao share a great moment after they've recovered to an extent from their injuries. They talk about how the first user of flower breathing planted the sakura tree in front of them and named it Victory. Kanao wanted to tell the tree that they succeeded and Tanjiro can't help but think how kind this was of her. They continue to talk about how they are doing and both delight in Kaburamaru, the snake that Kanao inherited from Iguro the Serpent Hashira. Although Kanao definitely lost some vision in her remaining eye by using Vermilion Eye to save Tanjiro, she does explain that she still has some vision left. Although they part ways and Tanjiro is having dinner with Zenitsu, Nezuko, and Inosuke at the end of the chapter, the next chapter pretty much reveals who got together with whom. Chapter 205 is a huge time skip, where we first meet the descendants of Kanao and Tanjiro, namely Kanata Kamado, who looks very similar to Kanao, and Sumihiko Kamado, who looks very similar to Tanjiro. I have no doubt the name Kanata itself is a reference to Kanao's name. And at this point, some fans suggested that the ships still weren't official because descendants of these characters might have gotten together rather than the main characters themselves. 
Immediately I was like no way to this possibility and the mangaka clearly had my back and was kind enough to create an extended ending where it was confirmed that Tanjiro and Kanao did get together and were Kanata and Sumihiko's great great grandparents. In this extended ending we also saw flashbacks of Tanjiro and Kanao getting close, being nice to crows and being wrapped around together by their pet snake Kaburamaru who was probably a good wingman for Tanjiro. And in the final panel Tanjiro is holding Nezuko's hand with his left hand and Kanao's hand with his right, which is perfect. I love to see them together in the final panel of the series. So there we have it, the relationship between Tanjiro and Kano fully explained, although it didn't seem super promising at the start when Kano knocked him out and tried to kill his sister, they got over that hurdle with a little help from Tanjiro's amnesia, since he didn't even remember she did that. After Tanjiro flipped that coin at the butterfly estate, there was arguably no going back and their ship kept getting more and more perfect from there. They were both willing to risk their lives for one another and were both saved by one another on multiple occasions and in multiple ways. I truly love this couple and after her terrible upbringing I'm so glad Kanao got with someone she deserves, someone as kind as Tanjiro. It truly warms my heart every time I think about this perfect ship. Zenitsu x Nezuko Zenitsu debuted in chapter 6 during the final selection arc along with Kanao. He didn't really do anything, he was just singled out for a second, a little foreshadowing that he along with Kanao and Genya would be important to the story moving forward. He's one of the few people to pass the exam and when we see him next during chapter 8, he's the only one of the four present stricken by fear after passing the exam, thinking to himself over and over again that he's going to die even though he survived here, he'll die in the end. He also gets a sparrow while the others get a crow, which is pretty hilarious. But yeah, let's keep in mind that one of the main things we know about Zainzu right from the get go is that he carries a lot of fear. This detail will make his later actions for Nezuko all the more significant. It is not until chapter 19 that we see Zenitsu again and then we figure out another important aspect of Zenitsu's character, aside from his fear. The dude likes girls a lot and is pretty shameless when it comes to pursuing them. When Tanjiro sees him with Nezuko in his wooden backpack, Zenitsu is on his knees crying, begging for a random girl to marry him because he doesn't know when he'll die. He says please countless times. After Tanjiro saves the girl from the awkward situation Zenitsu put her in, she thanks him. Zenitsu says the girl likes him and is going to marry him only to get slapped and repeatedly hit by said girl until Tanjiro has to save Zenitsu this time from the girl telling her to calm down. We then find out that this girl is engaged and all she did was ask Zenitsu if he was alright because he looked sick at the side of the road and somehow that led to Zenitsu thinking she liked him and would marry him. Zenitsu doesn't blame himself after she leaves but rather asks Tanjiro why he interfered and then we get the memeified look of disgust from Tanjiro. So yeah, so far Zenitsu doesn't look so hot. At this point he's like a young frightened master Roshi and Tanjiro looks at him as if he were some truly pitiful creature. Zenitsu reveals that he's a swordsman because a woman tricked him and put him deep into debt and his trainer was an old man who took on that debt. So clearly Zenitsu does not have a good track record with girls up to this point and in part that's because he often chooses the wrong girl to pursue, whether she's the kind that manipulates him for money or the kind that's already taken. Zenitsu joins Tanjiro on his journey and they go to see about a demon in a house but Zenitsu is too scared and sweaty to want to go in at first, but Tanjiro's look of disdain and pity finally makes him agree to go despite his fear. Tanjiro leaves Nezuko still in her box with the scared children but they leave her when they hear scratching. It is at this point that Tanjiro says that box holds the thing I value most, more important than my life itself. When Tanjiro and Zainitsu get separated, Zainitsu's immediate plan is to make it back outside with the boy. Zainitsu's so scared that the boy is worried more about Zainitsu rather than himself. Zainitsu sees a demon, he passes out, he enters enters avatar mode and defeats it and eventually he makes it outside where he protects the box Nezuko is in from Inosuke who keeps hitting him. Now, here for the first time, Zenitsu's shown a very respectable side of himself. Despite all of his fear, he was ready to take whatever punishment Inosuke could dish out in order to protect Nezuko's box. Yes, he didn't really know Nezuko yet, but it's significant that she's tied in a way to this big moment of his. You could already say that she brought out the best of him even this early on. When Tanjiro comes out of the house and sees what's happening, Zenitsu tells Tanjiro he protected this because Tanjiro said it was more important than his own life. This moment would have been powerful no matter what but it's way more powerful because we saw how over the top scared Zainzu always seemed to be up to this point. Yet consciously, he decided to help his new friend despite all the fear and the pain. As we find out, he knew from the start that a demon was in the box because of his amazing sense of hearing. And yet, in all his life, he never heard a sound that was so full of kindness as the sound that Tanjiro
Tanjiro makes. So he decides to trust that there's a good reason for Tanjiro carrying around a demon and he will protect it no matter what until he can ask Tanjiro directly about it. It's amazing characterization for Zenitsu and when Tanjiro sees a beat up Zenitsu gripping the box to protect it, he has flashbacks of what happened to his family, possibly even foreshadowing Zenitsu's eventual inclusion into Tanjiro's family, but also showing him that this blonde dude is actually worthy of friendship and maybe even worthy of being the person that protects Nezuko. Am I getting a little ahead of myself? Yeah, but all of these moments take on new significance when we know what's to come. Either way, eventually Tundra acknowledges Zenitsu as a really great guy when he finds out that he protected the box despite knowing a demon was in it. Tundra even said that from the start, his sense of smell told him that contrary to appearances, Zenitsu was actually good and strong. So this was just Zenitsu proving what Tundra already sensed. Already things are looking good for Zenitsu because of course Tundra wouldn't mind his sister ending up with a good strong guy who would protect Nezuko even before meeting her, despite how scared he was and the risk he had to undertake take in doing so. Then we get the first official face to face meeting of Zainzu and Nezuko. At first Zainzu is horrified when she begins coming out only to fall in love with her at first sight when he actually sees her. In his view she straight up sparkles despite being a demon. Zainzu's first thought is to be jealous of Tanjiro because he has it so good. Being with this cute girl every day and traveling in pure bliss. Keep in mind Zainzu doesn't let Tanjiro explain that it's his sister at first. So Zainzu is appalled that he went through so much suffering just so Tanjiro Tanjiro could be all lovey-dovey with a girl. After finding out she was Tanjiro's sister the entire time, Zainzu was on his best behavior, wanting to obtain Tanjiro's forgiveness. After all, you want to be on good terms with a brother if you want to marry the sister. One of the first things Zainzu did was present Nezuko with flowers, something we'd all recognize as a romantic gesture for a girl you like. For Zainzu, it was a complete 180 from utter despair to blissful hope that he now had a chance to end up with Nezuko. Unlike Kano and Tanjiro's relationship, from the moment Zainzu sees Nezuko, his feelings are very obvious. There is no doubt that he likes her and wants to marry her. The only question is, will she want to marry him? During the Natagumo mountain arc mission, at first, Zainzu doesn't follow them up that scary mountain. But as soon as he remembers that Tanjiro has Nezuko with him, he rushes to catch up, calling Tanjiro an idiot for taking a girl someplace dangerous. Again, Again, we start to see how Nezuko is the key for Zainzu overcoming his character flaws, like being paralyzed by excessive fear and also eventually not being as crazy about every girl because he has his own that he can direct all of his love towards. And because Nezuko is a good person, he'll no longer have to be worried about being manipulated for money which got him here in the first place. On the mountain when he's scared he also motivates himself by thinking of his head on Nezuko's lap. If he were dreaming and he woke up with Nezuko, he would work really hard he says, he'd even play plow three fields. It's telling that she's the one person he thinks about, not any other woman, when he finds himself in a nightmarish, spider-filled situation like this one. We find out that Zainzu didn't have parents, so no one ever expected anything of him until his gramps, aka his sensei. He thinks of Nezuko when he thinks about a dream of spending his whole life protecting others or making them happy. His gramps never giving up on him inspires him to actually try to pursue such a dream and gives him strength to defeat his enemy spider demon in epic fashion. Still, he manages to get so poisoned that he thinks he's going to die. And in this situation, he chooses to apologize to Nezuko rather than anyone else before Shinobu saves him. Then we jump to the rehabilitation arc, where we find out despite his love for Nezuko, Zainzu is still into other girls as well, even if the emotions are more superficial compared to what he feels for Nezuko. When he finally gets to participate in rehabilitation training, he he gets crazy excited about the idea of getting to touch the girls, getting massages from them, getting to touch their hands with the cup game, and getting to grab them for the tag game. He's so angry that Tanjiro and Inosuke made it seem terrible when the training is actually heaven because they got to do all of the above mentioned stuff with attractive girls that smell great. And for a while, he really did enjoy those excruciating massages from Aoi and laughed during them, while Tanjiro and Inosuke were more likely to cry from the pain. So it would be a stretch to say that Zainzu stopped looking at other girls when he met Nezuko. But notably, he wasn't as pathetic anymore, getting on his knees and begging other girls to marry him. And although he clearly was still attracted to other girls, Nezuko was always the main girl he kept coming back to in his thoughts. Zainzu even stopped coming to see Kanao when he kept losing to her in the tag game and the cup game, despite the fact that, as he previously mentioned, it was a joy to just look at such attractive girls. My point is, although he still did embarrassing things, he clearly wasn't as desperate as he was before. But women still did have a strong effect on him as we saw when Shinobu used her charms to motivate him so that he could master total concentration breathing in only 9 days. 
Significantly though, at the end of the day, he'd always seem to come back to Nezuko. As we saw in chapter 51, he talked to her while she was still in her box, about his day and what happened. Nezuko would scratch the box to communicate back, which Zaitsu could apparently use his OP sense of hearing to understand, and hearts would appear around him, as he promised to take her to where the flower he brought her was blooming. This is just one small scene in the story, but such an important one because it lets us know that off screen, Zaitsu and Nezuko have been communicating and spending a lot of time together. And although Zenitsu gets physically attracted to other girls, the hearts that appear around him, which connote his love, are reserved for Nezuko. At the end of chapter 51, during the bonus page where the mangaka usually gives us some fun extra sketches, we see that Zenitsu is showing Nezuko goldfish and she seems to be in love with the sight of them. He brought them to Nezuko without asking Shinobu and later got chewed out by Aoi for doing it, which goes to show the lengths he'll go to to make Nezuko happy. These little moments are important because they show this isn't a one-sided relationship. Nezuko as mentioned communicates back with Zenitsu and appears to enjoy spending time with him. And bonus points go to Zenitsu for being so nice and caring when it comes to the way he treats Nezuko. At the end of chapter 54 on the bonus page we see Zenitsu with hearts in his eyes carrying Nezuko while literally jumping for joy. Notably Nezuko is evidently laughing joyfully as well. After seeing this bonus page it's not surprising that Zenitsu dreams about he and Nezuko running through a field during the Mugen train arc. So that's clearly his greatest wish. Which is sweet. Obviously he cares about Tanjiro too and others, but you'll notice that Nezuko takes priority over everyone here, including all of the girls of his past and the girls of the butterfly estate who he found attractive as well. He dreams of making a ring of flowers for Nezuko, arguably a metaphorical wedding ring in this instance, and Nezuko agrees. Saitsu doesn't just dream of her saying yes to him though, he also imagines doing acts of service for her like carrying her on his back over a river because she can't swim. In contrast, Tanjiro dreamt of his family, Inosuke dreamt of the whole gang only he was the clear leader, and then Goku dreamt of his brother. Zaitsu is the only one to dream of a romantic other, which goes to show how much he cares about Nezuko and how much she means to him. When Zaitsu finds the infiltrator in his subconscious, he tells him that only Nezuko is allowed in there, again reiterating how important she is to him. When Nezuko gets into trouble and caught by the demon train in real life, Zaitsu comes to the rescue and frees her using his thunder breathing, proclaiming that he will protect Nezuko, and Nezuko is visibly touched before Zaitsu starts snoring, revealing that he's still asleep. At the end of chapter 65, for the bonus page, we straight up see Nezuko serving as a lap pillow for the sleeping Zenitsu, and holding his head. So yeah, at this point you gotta be pretty crazy to think that these two will not end up together. Compared to Tanjiro and Kanao, we've gotten so many scenes and clues that these two are going to end up together. And even though it seems pretty one-sided at first glance, a closer examination reveals that Nezuko does seem to care about Zenitsu, and he clearly makes her happy. And that will become only more clear later on. After the battle with Akaza, we're told that Zaintsu stopped whining, even when he went on missions alone. He did ask for a lock of Nezuko's hair though, so that he'll fight harder. Although that probably seems weird to most of us now, it wasn't that unheard of in the past that a dude would keep a lock of his love's hair with him. So again, it's symbolic of Zaintsu and Nezuko's relationship and how he wants to symbolically keep her with him at all times, even when they're away from each other. The thought of her gives him motivation, and when he ran with Tanjiro and Inosuke, he motivated himself by simply yelling out Nezuko's name repeatedly. This, my friends, is a man deeply in love if I've ever seen one. From this moment on, Zaitsu still wants to protect other girls, or come running if he hears them crying, or show his envy when he hears that the sound Hashira has three wives, but Nezuko is the consistent girl he thinks about and the one he wants to make his wife. He's no longer as indiscriminate in his advances towards women as a Roshi or a Mineta. Now, let's fast forward all the way to when Nezuko becomes immune to the sun and starts speaking again. Of course, the question is, for the purpose of this video, what does she say to Zaitsu and how does Zaitsu respond to the fact that she can speak now and go out in the sun. Well, as you may have imagined, Zaintsu is over the moon. He can't help but scream and other girls are begging him to be quiet. But notably, Nezuko blushes and smiles, saying welcome back to Zenitsu. The contrast between her reaction compared to that of the other girls is another great sign for Zenitsu. He says that Nezuko is so cute he could die now, and almost immediately asks if they can finally get married now. His expressions say it all, just how insanely obsessed he is with Nezuko. He begs Nezuko multiple times to marry him, 
and promises to feed her sushi and eel every day. And then Nezuko says, welcome back Inosuke, which makes Zenitsu immediately want to kill Inosuke. The thing is, Nezuko is not fully back to normal, and her speech is still limited. So when Inosuke spent the last two days trying to get Nezuko to say his name, it's not surprising that she said it here. But it's hilarious how it comes off, so that Zenitsu is so clearly obsessed with Nezuko on the one hand, and she appears to not even recall who he is. Of course, Zenitsu is not discouraged and continues to be persistent. The only time Zenitsu took a break from being his Nezuko obsessed self was when he realized that his sensei died, took his own life because Zenitsu's old senpai Kaigaku, who also trained under his sensei, became a demon. At that point, Zenitsu starts preparing to defeat him, and even Tanjo notices he's not his usual self. And so Zenitsu eventually does confront Kaigaku, who is now Upper Moon 6. Zenitsu, in a sense, has to earn his happy ending by confronting his fear in his past, and against Kaigaku, he actually speaks arrogantly in contrast to his old frightened self. He calls Kaigaku too slow and eventually finishes Kaigaku with his own original seventh form of thunder breathing. Zenitsu's new attack is so fast that the demon enhanced Kaigaku can't even see it. Finally, after he faced his past and avenged his sensei or gramps, as he called him, Zenitsu has arguably earned his happy ending. Not only has he been persistent with Nezuko, he's also proven through his actions that he is worthy of her. Of course, Zenitsu will still help in the fight against Muzan, but there's no doubt that his finest moment, combat wise and character development wise, was his triumph against Kaigaku and Upper Moon and the man responsible for Sensei's death. The dude beat an Upper Moon by himself while he was conscious. Such a great moment and I can't wait to see it animated. Now fast forward to the final Muzan fight. During chapter 196, Nezuko starts reverting back into a human and all her memories start to flood in as well, and along with them she sees a memory of Zenitsu offering her flowers, showing that she has not forgotten his kind gestures. Around the same time, Zenitsu shows up to help fight Muzan. Being the best brother-in-law ever, Zenitsu promises to Tanjo that he's not going to die, rather Tanjo is going home with a human Nezuko. Without hesitation, he risks his life fighting the strongest demon in an attempt to save Tanjiro and gets slammed into a building in the process. My boy gets back up to Muzan's surprise and even with a broken leg is able to use his 7th form Flaming Thunder God against Muzan. He keeps fighting helping Tanjiro finally pin Muzan to the wall so that he won't be able to escape the sun. After the whole giant baby Muzan thing, Tanjiro starts to become the demon king. He attacks everyone indiscriminately and of course Zenitsu with tears in his eyes tries to get through to him asking Tanjiro what about Nezuko? Will he really become a demon and hurt her like that right after she just returned to being a human again. At this point, it's made pretty clear that even before the marriage of Nezuko and Zenitsu, Tanjiro, Zenitsu, and Inosuke considered each other brothers. So this fight against demon Tanjiro is understandably extremely hard for them. Inosuke can't bring himself to kill Tanjiro, and eventually Nezuko steps in in order to try and stop him. She hugs him and Tanjiro bites her. Not surprisingly, Zenitsu jumps in and hugs Tanjiro too, telling him to stop and that he's killing Nezuko. As Nezuko continues to get hurt, Zenitsu cries calling out her name. Unfortunately, after all the fighting, he's pretty much out of commission and he can't stop Tanjiro. Luckily, as we discussed, Kano comes to the rescue with the medicine and that, along with everyone's feelings, reach Tanjiro and he becomes a human yet again. And just as he promised, Zenitsu gets to take Tanjiro and Nezuko back home. Although if we're being literal, Nezuko actually takes Zenitsu, but we'll get to that soon. Before that though, we do get a great part where Tanjiro is back to normal, and Inosuke comments that the injuries Tanjiro gave him are not a big deal. But Zenitsu says that for the rest of Tanjiro's life, he'll make him regret what he did to his wife. Nezuko now fully human and more shy than her demon self, is nervous at hearing the word wife, and is shown sweating, but significantly enough, she doesn't say she won't be Zenitsu's wife. During chapter 204, we get a moment with Sanemi, the Wind Hasha, and Nezuko. Remember, Sanemi hurt Nezuko and wanted to kill her while she was a demon. And so this is an important scene, where he finally apologized and pretty much admitted he was wrong about her. He saw his little brother in her, and so went to pat her on the head. Sanemi is an older guy and not Nezuko's brother, so she gets embarrassed, sweating and blushing as he says, take care. We see Zenitsu spying on them, and he gets angry and jealous, wondering what it is he just saw. However, he has nothing to worry about since he ends up being the one who goes to live with Nezuko and Tanjiro along with Inosuke. We get scenes of Nezuko petting and comforting Zenitsu when he complains about it being dark and how hungry he is. And although he's tired, he definitely doesn't mind being comforted by Nezuko. When Tanjiro and Nezuko make it home, they are greeted and hugged by a neighbor. And hilariously enough, Zenitsu joins in on the hug while Inosuke watches confused. Like what is this hug thing? When they pray for the deceased significantly enough, Tanjiro is on one side of Nezuko and Zenitsu is on the 
the other. On the last page, Zaintsu and Nezuko are sitting and eating beside each other. They are smiling at each other and passing food as hearts continue to float around Zaintsu's head. And that is it, the ending of the story before we jump to the giant time skip that reveals the descendants of our main characters. In this final chapter, we find out that yes, in fact, Zaintsu and Nezuko did get together and their descendants are called Yoshiteru Agatsuma, a 17-year-old who looks like Zenitsu with black hair, and his older sister, the 18-year-old Toko Agatsuma, who looks exactly like Nezuko. In fact, the chapter starts with Yoshiteru, aka Zenitsu's great-grandson, reading a book Zenitsu wrote about their demon slaying adventures. The hilarious thing is also that he called the book The Legend of Zenitsu. That definitely cracked me up. And at the end of the chapter, we see a framed image of our main characters in the Kamado house, and Nezuko and Zenitsu are shown together, both leaning into each other. And that is the end of the series, or at least that was the end before we got the bonus extended ending that was released within the final volume of the manga. From a Zenitsu and Nezuko perspective, it does give us some significant extra information. We get scenes of Tanjiro and Nezuko beginning to cry when they sense the presence of their family when they come home. And Zenitsu joins in on the cry and group hug, and this time a nervous Inosuke even tries his hand at the group hug, another hilarious moment. We get some more panels of Zenitsu looking all lovey-dovey at Nezuko, and thinking that she's too obliging to Inosuke when he insists on having his height measured immediately. We are also told that because of the after effects of Zainzu's injuries, he kept crying about his painful legs while they walked to put flowers on all the graves. And while Inosuke ignored him, Nezuko decided to carry him on her shoulders. So sweet. We also get some more information on the descendants and see Yoshiteru and Toko's two little sisters, one of whom looks like a female Zenitsu with the same eyebrows. Very cute. We see some other scenes including more scenes of Zenitsu and Nezuko laughing together and even a scene that could be Nezuko and Zenitsu getting married where Zenitsu finally puts that ring of flowers that he dreamed of making on Nezuko's head to her great delight and his sparrow even helps him which is a nice Disney-esque touch. A happy ending for these two is exactly what we wanted and needed. In this final panel, just as Tanjiro is holding Kano's hand, Zaintu is holding Nezuko's as they look off into the sky together. And that is it, everything there is to know about Zenitsu and Nezuko's relationship, which is in many ways the most focused on ship in the entire series. Although I explained how an observant person could pick up on the fact that Tanjiro and Kano would end up together, it's much more obvious with Zenitsu and Nezuko as from the the get-go, Zaintsu is extremely upfront about his romantic feelings and repeatedly asks Nezuko to marry him. I hope I've also shown that there were signs that not only did Zaintsu show feelings for Nezuko, but Nezuko also showed signs that she'd end up with Zaintsu as well. She always enjoyed his company, unlike many other girls, and when she became fully human again, she was ready to fully return his feelings. This relationship is, in part, such a satisfying one because it was always so obvious how much Zaintsu loved Nezuko, and so I was really rooting for him to get his happy ending with with her, especially considering his past, where he was completely alone except for women who used him for money and eventually his sensei. He started out as an orphan but ended up being a part of this beautiful family with Nezuko and Tanjiro and they clearly go on to start their own family as well that will continue to have many descendants. For Nezuko it's a win too because she doesn't get the obsessed over every woman scaredy cat that Zenitsu was in the beginning of the series. Rather Zenitsu has grown from begging random girls on the street to marry him to focusing on on one that likes him and will treat him right. He also was always very kind and considerate to Nezuko, even when others couldn't see her as a human and just viewed her as a demonic monster. Furthermore, he proved that he was able to overcome his fear when it came to protecting Nezuko, and with Nezuko there to motivate him, he ended up becoming one of the strongest swordsmen alive. Inosuke x Aoi out of the three main relationships from the series, this one is probably the one that comes out of left field the most, which is part of what makes it such an interesting one to discuss. And we'll go into reasons why it feels a bit random, as we also analyze the story for clues of Inosuke and Aoi's interest in one another. Inosuke actually appears to be younger than Aoi. Inosuke is 15 years old, while in the first Demon Slayer Light novel, Flower of Happiness, Aoi reveals that she's older than the 16-year-old Kano. Thus, she's either 16 and a few months older than Kanao, or even older than 16. Inosuke and Aoi have their similarities and differences. The sometimes girl-faced, sometimes boar-faced Inosuke is short-tempered, and Aoi reveals in the novel that she also has an impatient personality. They both aren't afraid to speak their mind, however, there are also differences. While Inosuke is introduced to us as someone who loves fighting with strong opponents and gathered pride from winning battles, Aoi was scared of battle, and viewed herself as human trash that was lucky to survive final selection. 
collection. Aoi carried around feelings of inferiority because she thought that there was no value to a squad member who didn't kill demons, but only helped take care of injured squad members and carried out physical rehabilitation. We'll get to this in the main story, but in the novel it's also mentioned that she trembled uncontrollably when the sound Hashira ordered her to follow him on a mission. So in stark contrast to Inosuke, she is most definitely not a fighter. So they have a bit of an opposites attract thing going on there. Thus their division of labor is pretty traditional. She can cook and help heal Inosuke's injuries, while he can protect her from physical threats, whether human, animal, or demon. So now that we have a basic understanding of their personalities and how they mesh with each other, let's jump into the main story and search for clues of love. Aoi makes her debut in chapter 48 when Tanjiro arrives to the butterfly estate. Aoi is one of the girls that helps out there, and let's just say she's not shy. If Shinobu isn't there, Aoi is pretty much in charge and her orders go, since Kanao doesn't really respond or talk to people at this point. After Tanjiro and the Demon Slayer help her ask Kanao questions and things get awkward because she just continues to smile without answering them, it's Aoi who finally shows up and breaks the tension. She has a commanding presence and this is what I meant about her not being shy in the least. She screams, who the hell are you? To Tanjiro and the helper, causing them both to tremble in fear. I don't want this to come off as a negative even though it tends to have negative connotations, but you could say that, very much like Inosuke, Aoi is a loudmouth. Loudmouth refers to someone who tends to talk a lot in an offensive or or tactless way, and that's exactly what we see happening here. That hell she used in her dialogue wasn't dropped in there by accident, it's there to give us a sense of her personality, which is very unique among the female characters we've come to know so far. You can imagine how loud Inosuke and her future home might be, with both of their aggressive and loud personalities clashing. She goes on to order Tundra and the helpers to follow her and starts stomping off another parallel with Inosuke, who loves pretending that he's the boss and that Tanjiro and Zenitsu are his underlings. When Zenitsu is causing trouble, she tells him to pipe down, frightening him in the process. She's the opposite of a pushover and tells Zenitsu that if he doesn't behave, she'll tie him down. Zenitsu even starts crying, telling Tanjiro that he was stabbed and poisoned by a spider, but Aoi getting angry at him is even worse. It's hard not to appreciate Aoi's strong personality and no-nonsense approach here. She definitely debuts with a bang, and even though she is suffering from a sense of inferiority at this point, as we'll find out, it adds depth to her character as she can unabashedly run the show and tell actual demon slayers what to do without being the least bit apologetic about it. Inosuke is actually not his usual self at this point. His throat got crushed and he's depressed, just being quiet in his bed as the great reunion with Tanjiro is taking place. Even though Aoi and Inosuke were in the same room here, there was no focus on their relationship, no interaction that we can point to. So compared to the Zenitsu going crazy over seeing Nezuko's scene, and Tanjiro's looking back at Kanao as the helpers are taking him away, this scene is interesting and notable because it doesn't include anything special. It clearly wasn't love at first sight with these two as far as we can tell, which makes sense when one of the people is wearing a boar mask after all, and since Inosuke is the youngest too, it makes sense that he'd be the last one to mature and start noticing girls. During these Butterfly Estate chapters, we are also told by the author that there's a rumor that Aoi was the one who repaired Nezuko's box. We're told she's got skills as she wears an angry face, but is working on fixing Nezuko's box. It captures her character well. She seems like an angry, hateful person sometimes, but is actually really nice, sort of like a tsundere. Unlike Zenitsu, Inosuke did not enjoy the idea of girls loosening up his muscles and getting the chance to grab Aoi and Kano in a tag game. When Zenitsu is psyched about the prospect, Inosuke simply says, and I quote, stop talking nonsense. Losing to those tiny girls is embarrassing, end quote. Showing that his mind was obviously not on girls at this point in his life, unlike Zenitsu's. Zenitsu even calls Inosuke out for his naivete, saying that he bets Inosuke never even spent any time with girls before, only for Inosuke to misunderstand and say that he stepped on plenty of girls. Even though we don't see Aoi showing signs she likes Inosuke, we do see signs she doesn't like or appreciate Zainitsu's advances. She doesn't like it when Zainitsu holds her hand and beats him up for grabbing her during the tag game. It's hilarious to watch because as Zainitsu is trying to win her over, not even willing to throw the drink in her face, Inosuke is not trying at all. He has no qualms about throwing the drink in her face and even grabs her by the feet and hangs her upside down during tag, even though all he had to do was touch her to win. Knowing what we know now, all these early earlier parts are hilarious. Aoi would go on to develop feelings, or maybe even is developing feelings at this point, for the guy who isn't the least bit concerned with being nice or polite to her. And I mean, she isn't too concerned with being polite herself, so it's not a surprising match. When the gang is leaving for the Mugen Train arc, Aoi is nice enough, telling Tanjiro that it wasn't long, but she's glad they got to spend time together, and she wishes Tanjiro good luck. 
This is the really sweet moment when Tanjiro thanks her for taking care of them and says that it is thanks to her that he can fight again. Aoi says compared to them she's not important so the thanks isn't necessary. She survived final selection due to pure luck and since then she's been afraid to fight. So she's just a coward. Tanjiro really hits her emotionally when he says that it doesn't matter that she doesn't fight demons. She helped him so she's a part of him now he'll think about her when he goes into battle. You can tell by the panel that she is very touched by Tanjiro's words. Tanjiro goes on to talk to Kano after this, and Kano actually blushes in the manga after he leaves, while Aoi doesn't. It's not romantic with Aoi and Tanjiro, but it's still a big deal because Tanjiro transformed Aoi's self-image here. Instead of viewing herself as a coward who is useless and should at the very least heal people who are her superiors, Tanjiro tells her that her part or role is just as important and that if the people she saves go on to defeat demons, it's her victory too, because she is a part of them now. Unfortunately, we don't get to see Inosuke's parting words to Aoi here, if they did specifically feel the need to exchange any. After all, Inosuke is his own beast who doesn't follow usual conventions, and while Tanjiro and Zenitsu are shown tearing up at their parting with the little butterfly state girls, Inosuke is just wearing his mask and we see no tears. Still, the fact that Aoi uncharacteristically said she enjoyed spending time with the trio could be a sign that she liked having Inosuke around as well. After the Mugen Train arc, the gang is at the Butterfly Estate again. One day, Tanjiro is returning from a solo mission, and this is when he overhears Aoi's screams, while Tengen, the sound Hashira, is trying to forcefully take her on a mission. She looks very scared and nervous. She sweats as she tells the Hashira who is carrying her to let her go. He even tries to take one of the younger girls at first, who aren't even core members, and accordingly, aren't wearing the Demon Slayer uniform. I briefly mentioned this near the beginning of the video, but it really is touching that when Aoi screams out for Kano's help, Kano actually moves to help. She sweats a lot as she thinks about her duty, the fact that Tengen is a superior officer, and so on. But then she recalls Tanjiro's advice to obey her heart, and that gives her the strength to grab hold of Aoi. Aoi is brought to tears by the fact that Kano, who for a long time just followed the orders of superiors, finally broke that rule. As far as the Demon Slayer Code goes, it appears like Tengen is in his right to do this. He implies that he only has to ask for Shinobu's permission to take a Demon Slayer graduate on a mission if she is a Tsuguko, aka the chosen successor of a Hashira. Thus, he couldn't take Kano without asking Shinobu, but he could take Aoi. Official Demon Slayer rules aside though, everyone realizes how wrong he is from an ethical standpoint, and Tanjiro steps in to help. He tries to headbutt Tengen, but for once his super effective headbutt misses because of Tengen's speed. Finally, Tanjiro insists that if Tengen needs help, he'll go instead of Aoi. Zenitsu and Inosuke show up at this point, and Inosuke says before Zenitsu, and I quote, I just got back, but I'm not tired. I don't mind going either, end quote. It's not quite a proclamation of love, but whenever Inosuke seems to be doing something nice for someone else, you gotta stop and notice, and in this case, he does it on his future wife's behalf. Their feelings for each other aren't very clear yet, but the evidence that they like each other and want to help each other is slowly growing, and it's probably not lost on Aoi that Inosuke Inosuke was willing to risk his life on a dangerous mission to save her from having to do so. It's true that Tanjiro and Zenitsu were willing to do so too, but they are already occupied with budding love interests like Kano and Nezuko. Now let's fast forward to chapter 100 after the trio come back from their Upper Moon 6 fight. Kano is by Tanjiro's side, but Aoi isn't. Aoi comes in after Tanjiro wakes up, crying because she blames herself for all their serious injuries. After all, as she points out, they were hurt because they went instead of her. Tanjiro finds out that Tengen and Zenitsu's injuries weren't as bad as his, but when he asks about Inosuke, one of the Butterfly State girls says he was in danger for a while too. She's not crying at delivering this news, but Aoi is crying a lot. It's actually quite a touching panel. She says, and I quote, Inosuke's condition was really bad. The poison got deep in him, so he was slow to use breathing to stop the bleeding and, end quote. She doesn't even finish her sentence before Tanjiro spots Inosuke on the roof. This is a significant moment where we finally get Aoi specifically worrying and crying about Inosuke in a way other girls don't. We can assume that while Kanao was by Tanjiro's side the most, Aoi was by Inosuke's. It's clear that no other girl present had Inosuke on her mind and in her thoughts as much as Aoi. While Inosuke calls himself immortal and one of the little girls calls him dumb, it's Aoi who steps in and holds Inosuke back from attacking her. She yells at him saying the poison doesn't work well on Inosuke but neither does medicine, so he has to be careful. She criticizes him for already forgetting that Shinobu 
who told him this, but her outward frustration clearly points to her caring about Inosuke. After all, she wouldn't get so wound up if she didn't care about what happened to him. Inosuke as hilarious as usual tells Aoi to shut up and to stop pulling on him, and even calls her a shrimp, only for her to say that they aren't that different in height. It's a funny relationship dynamic between two short-tempered loudmouths with hearts of gold that's completely different from the other romantic relationship dynamics we see in the series. And even though they can both act like tsundere and haven't confessed their feelings to each other, after this, there is good reason to ship them besides just the fact that the other characters are already shipped with each other. Aoi was deeply affected by his injuries and continues to get emotional about it even though he's fine now and continues to care about him, warning him that he needs to be careful despite him continuing to be rude to her as usual. And you can also assume that they wouldn't care to bicker with each other so much if they had no feelings for each other. It's been said that the opposite of love isn't hate but indifference and these two are definitely not indifferent with one another. We also find out during Shinobu's fight against Doma that Aoi's family was killed by demons, just like Inosuke's mother was killed by a demon namely Doma. It's significant that Inosuke helped defeat Doma since it was revenge for his mother, but it was also revenge for Shinobu, one of the most important people in Aoi's life. Now let's fast forward to after the world is saved from the Demon King of Pop. Inosuke and Aoi get another telling scene. Inosuke is walking around the butterfly estate thinking about how hungry he is. He starts stealing food while Aoi is cooking and she calls him out for it. Inosuke lies but wonders how she notices so fast and that maybe she's strong, which is definitely a plus in Inosuke's books. And then we get an adorable part where Aoi gives Inosuke his own plate and says that when he's hungry he can eat from it. This plate will just be for him so he can eat eat from it whenever he wants to. The implication is that she'll keep refilling it and making special meals for Inosuke. Inosuke this time is the one who stares at Aoi and blushes. He looks down at the food and you see possibly the cutest smile in the series plastered on his face. Finally, we have hard evidence that Inosuke is into Aoi too and the way into his heart is through his stomach. Then all that's left except some bonus material we'll get into in a bit is the confirmation that they end up getting together. And we get this in the form of Aoba Hashibiri the great-grandson of Inosuke and Aoi. Even before it was confirmed that Aoi was the grandmother, it was suggested since the Aoa in Aoba seemed to come from the Aoa in Aoi. Then there's the new more detailed ending they included in the final Demon Slayer volume that gives us some scenes that fill in some of the gaps between chapter 204 and chapter 205. There's even one panel that shows what looks like Inosuke presenting his idea of a gift, which seems to be some stuff he just scavenged from nature, to Aoi and Aoi being genuinely touched to receive it. It appears to be a throwback to Inosuke's dream during the Mugen Train arc as well, where he presents Nezuko with some acorns and says, look, I'll give you these sparkly acorns, come on, end quote. He clearly associates it with being a nice gesture and with it being a way to get people to come with him. Our boy has legit started to act like Zanitsu who's always picking flowers for Nezuko. We also get a bit of info on their great-grandson Aoba here, like that he's 28th, lost his job, plays badminton with Tanjiro and Kanao's descendant, and has one little brother. Luckily, the mangaka makes up for the lack of focus on this relationship in the main story by focusing on it in the bonus materials like in the Demon Slayer fanbooks. In the second fanbook, it's revealed that whenever Nezuko visited Kanao and Aoi once a month, Inosuke would go with her. Zanitsu hated him for it, but more importantly, it gave Inosuke the time he would have needed to grow closer to Aoi and vice versa. Furthermore, in the second fanbook, it's revealed that Aoi doesn't smile much, but Inosuke was able to make her laugh often by doing unexpected things. That's a sweet tidbit of information information and helps us in part understand why they'd end up together. Inosuke was special for being able to make Aoi, the female Giyu, smile often. And to those confused by the female Giyu comment, Giyu is famous in the Demon Slayer world for not smiling. And that is it for this low-key couple. Although it was the least focused on relationship of the big three, I hope I showed how it didn't come from nowhere and there were subtle clues earlier on that these two may well end up together, aside from just their at times strikingly similar personalities. I genuinely love these two as a couple and she definitely brought out some of Inosuke's cutest moments which is saying a lot since Inosuke tends to be manly most of the time rather than cute. Iguro x Mitsuri Obanai Iguro is the snake or serpent Hashira. He's 21 years old and when the mangaka ranked each Hashira's physical strength via how well they do in an arm wrestling contest, Iguro ranked below everyone except Shinobu, who we know is not even physically strong enough to cut off a demon's head. This means that yes, Iguro is physically weaker than the 19 year old love Hashira Mitsuri. He also eats way less, being able to go 3 days without eating, and he tends to give off a much darker vibe compared to Mitsuri's bright 
in warm one. It's definitely a situation where opposites attract, and in this case, there is clearly some subversion of traditional gender norms as well. As I mentioned, Igor is physically weaker, and we were even told that he'd rank lower than the 14-year-old Muichiro and the Nanhasha Tanjiro in the arm wrestling competition. Another interesting detail is that Mitsuri is taller than Iguro. Mitsuri is 167 centimeters, or about 5 feet and 6 inches, and Iguro is 162 centimeters, or about 5 feet and 4 inches. So we covered some fundamental and superficial stuff about these two, but now let's jump into the manga and see how the love story evolved over time. Although they already knew each other by this point, Iguro fully debuts during chapter 45 of the manga. It's the Hashira meeting, and in contrast to the forgiving Mitsuri, Iguro wants to punish Giyu for breaking core rules and protecting the demon Nezuko. By the way, coolness points for the fact that he's just chilling on the tree while the others all stand on the ground. I gotta just say that one of the reasons I love this ship so much is because because Iguro is possibly my favorite Hashira, and I just love his character. He also has one of the most unique looks with his differently colored eyes, bandages covering his mouth, and a living snake necklace. But of course, Iguro doesn't view the snake as a necklace, but as a friend. But anyways, back to the story, Mitsuri responds to Iguro's words with a heart popping up above her head in the manga. She thinks to herself, and I quote, As usual, Iguro is as coolly menacing as a snake. He's reliable, which is nice, end quote. She's blushing as well. In most cases, it would be clear that she's in love with him, but it's not so clear with the love Hashira since she also blushes thinking of Tanjiro, Giyu, Sanemi, Shinobu, and so on. The love Hashira blushes and has hearts coming from her character in multiple cases, which I suppose goes with the whole being the love Hashira thing. Thus, she has a positive view of Iguro, but in the beginning, it doesn't seem to be especially significant because she has such positive views about the others as well. After all, she's a very positive person. Iguro doesn't make it clear that he's into Mitsuri here either. He more so makes it clear that he's pretty ruthless in contrast to Mitsuri, who aside from Giyu, has the most compassion for Tanjiro and Nezuko. When Sanemi wants to test Nezuko, Iguro is the one that reminds him that it won't work in the light and he has to go into the shade or she won't come out. His personality and behavior are quickly established as being very different from Mitsuri's. Whereas Mitsuri felt pity for Tanjiro and thought he was cute, Iguro is the one who quickly elbows him to the ground when Tanjiro fails to show respect in front of their leader. And thus, we don't figure out much about these two except that Iguro is one of the many people she likes, and he can be pretty cruel and ruthless in contrast to Mitsuri, who is so positive and compassionate. We do see something that they both have in common during chapter 66. They're both affected by Rengoku's passing. If you didn't know, Rengoku trained Mitsuri and she was actually learning flame breathing before she developed her own style. She raises her hand to her mouth when she hears of her former mentor's passing, deeply moved. We don't see Iguro's expression but he does say he can't believe it, so he's clearly not indifferent to the news. We next see Iguro after the defeat of Upper Moon 6. He shows up to the scene and at first says he's impressed. But that initial bit of praise is quickly complicated when he asks what Tengen's going to do about losing his hand and an eye in a fight with a mere Upper 6. Again, not much kindness and empathy shown here. Instead of being glad Tengen's alive, he sort of insults him for losing limbs to a low Upper Moon, and then immediately asks how long will it take him to recover and who will replace him in the meantime. When Tengen tells him he plans to retire, now, Iguro thinks it's ridiculous and even says he won't allow it. Since they lost Rengoku, they desperately need a slayer of Tengen's caliber, even wounded, so he has to fight until he dies. What the manga is doing well here by depicting Iguro as such a ruthless, unfeeling dude is that she's preparing to move us when we finally find out how much Iguro does care about Mitsuri. We all know it's all the more impactful when a seeming jerk shows his soft side. I mean, just ask Bulma from Dragon Ball Z. Next, let's fast forward to chapter 101 just to see how much Mitsuri eats. Not only does she eat more than Iguro, as I mentioned, she eats way more than Tanjiro. It looks like when Goku eats and after she finishes all those dishes and Tanjiro says impressive, she says she didn't eat that much tonight, implying that she usually eats more. It's after this meal that Tanjiro asks Mitsuri why she joined the Demon Slayer Corps, and blushing, she answers to find the man to marry. She explains that it's good for a girl to find someone stronger than herself, someone to protect her. Now I know what some of you might be thinking, that Iguro is not physically stronger than Mitsuri, which is correct. But even if he's not physically stronger, he is the stronger swordsman and performs better in battle, as we'll see later. So as of now, we know that the love Hashira is looking for a dude who is stronger than her and who can protect her. Thus her options for ships are pretty much
much limited to male Hashira since she's so strong. And we can probably cross out Tengen who is weaker than her at this point and has three wives already and maybe even Sanemi the wind Hashira because Mitsuri remarks to Tanjiro that both Shinazugawa brothers scare her. Not to mention we figure out in bonus materials later on that Sanemi doesn't like Mitsuri's personality and that Sanemi and Iguro are really good friends so Sanemi would never even go after Mitsuri in the first place especially since he likes someone else as we'll get into later in the video. Anyways since Rengoku tragically died that only leaves Giyu, Iguro, Gyome and Muichiro as possible options. And keep in mind Muichiro is 5 years younger than Mitsuri at only 14 years old so really we're looking at 3 options. Either way Iguro is quickly becoming more and more of an option as we narrow down the possibilities using her own criteria. What's also relevant for the purposes of this video is Mitsuri's backstory during chapter 123. We get a flashback of pretty much how she was told she can't get married because of how funny her hair color is. Pretty strange reason to say someone can't get married but hey it happened. And that's something you gotta actually know about Mitsuri because as anime watchers I think most of us would just assume her hair is normal anime hair but in the world of Demon Slayer it's made clear that this is not the case. Two years ago she was 17 years old and her marriage arrangements fell through. We're also told in this flashback that she's the eightfold girl. Her muscle density is eight times that of a normal person. So if her actual muscle power was reflected in her body's appearance she'd look very jacked indeed. At only 13 months old Mitsuri lifted a rock that weighed 33 pounds. Her mother was shocked for the first time ever upon seeing this. It's also repeated that she had a big appetite and could eat, get this, more than three sumo wrestlers combined. None of these qualities were viewed as ladylike and appropriate for a would-be wife. So Mitsuri felt like she had to hide her true self. She dyed her hair black, ate so little that she always felt faint, and pretended to be weak despite the fact that she had superhuman strength. Finally, a man was ready to marry this version of her, but she didn't feel right. She wondered if there's a place where she could be herself. If there was a man out there who would accept her for her true self. Clearly Mitsuri wasn't looking for a lot, just someone who would like her for her. And she realized that no dude weaker than her her could probably do that based on her previous experiences, which is why she started searching for someone stronger. Significantly on the cover page of 124, we get a huge image of Mitsuri smiling and blushing while she eats. Iguro is sitting beside her, staring at her with gentle eyes. We're not giving the complete context here, but one can imagine that they are close and that they enjoy each other's company and that Iguro probably offered to pay to be a gentleman even though he probably barely ate. That last one might just be my interpretation, but the point is we'd already had her possible ships narrowed down to about three people at this point and now this image of them together pretty much narrows it down further to Iguro and the clues about their feelings for each other don't stop there not by a long shot. As more of Mitsuri's backstory is revealed, we find out that instead of getting married as someone she's not, she found a Demon Slayer core where her true self was seen as a blessing not a curse. Furthermore, she reveals that Iguro gave her the long striped green socks that she wears. Iguro can't even look her in the eye as he gives them and we see two hearts in midair between them. And at this point when we realize a big part of her image came from Iguro this whole time, it seems obvious that Iguro and Mitsuri are into each other and are probably going to end up together if any two Hashi a will. The question is why aren't they already together and that will be answered when we get to Iguro's backstory. For now let's fast forward to after Mitsuri's fight with Upper Moon 4. The Hashira meetup, Muichiro beat Upper Moon 5 and Mitsuri helped beat Upper Moon 4. Sanami comments that he's jealous that he never got to fight an Upper Moon but Iguro actually shows concern. He asks how Mitsuri and Muichiro are and it's so sweet to see Mitsuri's face light up as she says I'm much better thanks. Mitsuri blushes and sweats as she answers Iguro and if that was wasn't enough she even thinks to herself oh he's worried about me end quote. This is clearly one of the more focused on ships already and there will be even more significant moments that solidify the ship. However you can already tell that there are way more clues that these two will end up together than there were for Inosuke and Aoi even though these guys get less screen time than Inosuke. There's a funny part here though where they ask Mitsuri and Muichiro to explain how they unlock their Demon Slayer marks. Mitsuri tries to explain but is absolutely horrible at it and everyone is struck by how bad her explanation was. Iguro's reaction is emphasized, he even does a facepalm. 
She proceeds to apologize profusely for being terrible at explaining, but it was cute seeing how affected Iguro was by her embarrassing situation. I feel like this usually stoic dude wouldn't be so visibly affected by such a situation unless he cared about Mitsuri. The Hashira go on to run their own training courses and when Tanjiro gets to Iguro's course, we get even more clues as to how much Iguro cares about Mitsuri. We're told that the two Hashira exchange letters and when Iguro sees Tanjiro, he gets very angry uncharacteristically so. He mentions how Mitsuri told him about Tanjiro and how they had quite a lot of fun in training. Tanjiro senses that Iguro totally hates him from the start, but it seems more like jealousy because Tanjiro got so close to his precious Mitsuri. This hypothesis is confirmed when after Tanjiro passes the training, Iguro specifically warns him not to get too friendly with Mitsuri. I love Iguro's expression when he says this, his veins are even popping up on his head. So far they've done a really good job of slowly but surely sprinkling in the clues about how Iguro feels about Mitsuri and about how Mitsuri feels about Iguro. Mitsuri obviously never gets so overprotective and jealous over Iguro, but he does fit her criteria and it's clear she likes spending time with him, treasures his gifts to the point she wears the socks he gave her every day, and she even blushes and sweats at the thought that he's concerned about her. At this point, all we're waiting for is a confession of love or an explanation as to why we haven't gotten it yet. And now we fast forward to the Demon Slayers vs Muzan fight, part 1. Both Iguro and Mitsuri are present with the others, and probably not a coincidence, they are often shown close to each other in the panels, and as a result of their close proximity to each other, they get warped together. We get a sweet moment where some demon extras show up and Iguro handles them real quick saying, and I quote, stay away from Kanroji, end quote. We know that Mitsuri wanted exactly this, someone to protect her, and it's not a surprise that she brightens up and blushes when she sees this. She even thinks to herself, and I quote, Iguro is great, end quote. It's so cute seeing these two together. Iguro asks if she's hurt. She says no. He says let's go and she says okay, with three hearts floating in her speech bubble and I don't think we've ever seen her blush so hard. Based on this, she's clearly got the feels for Iguro too. And if you still don't think these two are perfect together, I just don't get you. But we'll get even more confirmation that they are. The two go on to fight the new upper moon for Nakime. And it's not really a fight in the conventional sense. Nakime gives them a lot of trouble but doesn't threaten their lives that much. In other words, she's not especially strong but her blood demon art is very tricky tricky and makes her hard to hit as she's shifting the dimension around them. During this fight, Mitsuri gets hasty and Iguro saves her by grabbing her while she's falling in midair. Iguro is so sweet as he tells her in a nice way, as long as they don't know their opponent's abilities, they should watch closely, think hard and proceed calmly. The last thing he wants is for Mitsuri to die. Later, when Tanjiro is confronting Muzan with Giyu, Tanjiro sees an image of Iguro and Mitsuri having been defeated. Now it's pretty obvious there's something fishy here since Iguro was built up big time, so so having him just lose off screen would be kind of ridiculous. If Mitsuri helped beat the old upper four, it's hard to believe that her and the stronger Iguro couldn't take down the new replacement. Still, for a second, this might look horrible. It looks like our Romeo and Juliet, the couple whose romantic relationship was probably emphasized the most in the whole series, might have died without ever confessing their love to each other in a straightforward way. Luckily, as we find out, this was Genjutsu via Yushiro, aka just an illusion. Mitsuri shows up soon enough to Muzan's shock as does Iguro, who helps save Tanjiro. If you pay close attention, you'll also see that Mitsuri is all beat up after the fight with Nakime, while Iguro doesn't have a scratch or speck of dirt on him, another sign of his advanced skills. As the fight against the Hashira and Muzan goes on, it's Mitsuri who starts falling behind. As Iguro mentions that he can no longer shield Gyome, probably one of the most flex lines in the entire series, Mitsuri is thinking that she can't see Muzan at all. She's relying on intuition and luck to dodge, and so she knows she'll be the first one to fall. So while Iguro has been protecting others in addition to himself, Mitsuri has been having trouble just keeping herself alive. And she proves to be correct, she's the one who gets seriously damaged by Muzan. Portion of her face and arm are taken off, and of course, Iguro's worried reaction is the first one we're shown after this happens. Once again, Iguro prioritizes her, and is the one who takes her to safety. He leaves her with people who can tend to her wounds, while Mitsuri is saying she can still fight. Iguro though, in a touching moment says no, she's done enough. Iguro then leaves, and a waterfall of tears falls down Mitsuri's face as she begs Iguro not to get himself killed. 
She also wishes that Iguro and her had met under normal circumstances, and we see an image of them in civilian clothing, strolling in nature like it was a Jane Austen novel. However, Iguro, whose mouth is finally exposed to reveal a Joker-like snake scar, says such a life was impossible for him. We finally see why he didn't make a move earlier. He says, unless I die and get a different body in which this filthy blood does not flow, I have no right to be with you. He has an inferiority complex, which is kind of funny just because Mitsuri obviously has an inferiority complex as well. They both don't think they're good enough, even though each would be ecstatic to have the other as a romantic partner. Iguro goes on to explain that he belongs to a corrupt bloodline that has killed to line its own pockets. With stolen money, they have inhabited mansions, feasted, and lived in unnecessary luxury. They were a shameless, avaricious, ostentatious, and ugly clan. Then we jump into his backstory. I will just say first that it frustrates me when characters think like this. That they can't be happy and have to pay for the sins of their bloodline, even if they themselves did nothing wrong. I'm not saying it's bad storytelling, and I'm sure there are those who blame themselves, like Iguro does, but I just love Iguro so much that it's hard for me to see him being so hard on himself. But that tangent aside, his backstory story is that he was born into a family of many girls and it had been 370 years since the last boy was born. Since birth, Iguro was confined in a cell. The woman fawned over him and brought him rich foods. There was so much food and the smell of it made him nauseous. In part, this probably explains why he doesn't eat that much. At night, he'd hear something creepy and massive crawling around. When he turned 12, he found out this was a serpent demon lady. This female demon was worshipped like a god by the family. The family lived off of the riches of the people this demon killed. In order to keep her happy, the family offered their newborns to her as a sacrifice. The demon took a special interest in Iguro, who was a rare boy with unusual eyes. As a result, she allowed him to grow to a more satiating size before she would eat him. At her meeting with the 12-year-old Iguro, she determined that she'd let him live a little longer, and even had his mouth cut to more closely match her own and the Joker's. Oh yeah, and she drank the blood that came from the process. Very messed up stuff. Now, back in his cell, Iguro was understandably thinking about escaping and surviving before he gets eaten by a gross lady demon. He used a stolen hairpin and began scratching away the lattice of his cell. This is the closest Demon Slayer gets to a prison break right here. At this point, he was very scared they'd find out, and the only creature he could trust was the snake Kaburamaru, who he still has to this day around his neck. I like the fact that they didn't demonize snakes here, and showed how yeah, this snake lady is evil, but Kaburamaru, who is a literal snake, is Iguro's best friend. There isn't something inherently bad about snake or serpent stuff, and that's reflected in the fact that Iguro goes on to become the serpent Hashira. Anyways, eventually he makes his escape with his friend Snake. The lady demon finds him, but before she can kill him, the flame Hashira saves him. This is a cool detail because this is probably Rengoku's father here before he fell off the rails and became a pessimistic drunk. Even though he eventually fell off, it's nice to know that his good deeds that he performed when he was a Hashira continued to have a huge impact in the present. After all, without him, we wouldn't have Iguro, who is insanely valuable as one of the strongest and most skilled Hashira. The flame Hashira brought Iguro together with his only surviving cousin, but she rejected him. And this part infuriates me too, because I feel so much for Iguro. She blames our boy Iguro for killing everyone. Why? Because 50 people died as a result of him running away. They would have lived if he just played the role of a happy sacrifice to the demon. Even though on some level Iguro knew her words were unjustified, her words still pained him. He had thought about what might happen to them, but decided to flee anyway because he wanted to live. He started viewing himself as corrupt, just like his filthy family. His sins were deep, so he could not live a normal life. With no other outlet, he turned his rage on demons. He risked his life for others, and felt as if he had in some way become a slightly better person each time. Nevertheless, the decaying hands of 50 people whose eyes shone with reproach continued to claw at him and hold him back. He wanted and planned to die, defeating Muzan, and prayed that the deed would purify his filthy blood. Then, if he were reborn as a human being, in a peaceful world without demons, he would tell Mitsuri of his feelings for her. So that's why he didn't confess his feelings up to this point. He felt like he was too corrupt, and the only way he may feel okay doing it was if he died defeating the strongest demon and was reincarnated. Like, bro, you did nothing wrong. I want to tell him. His family put him in that situation and was ready to sacrifice him, so him just trying to survive is completely understandable. Those women who died were guilty of not only benefiting from the demon killing others, but also for not helping Iguro and countless other babies. Partnering up with a demon has its risks, and having the demon suddenly destroy you all is one of the risks that comes with the territory. So part of me desperately wishes that Iguro didn't feel like this, but don't worry, 
we will get our happy ending and it'll be perfect. Even if, oddly, Iguro has to die first. Iguro goes on to be absolutely amazing in the fight against Muzan as I outlined in my How Strong Is Iguro video. Long story short, Iguro fulfills his wish. He puts up a valiant effort against Muzan, awakening the Demon Slayer mark, turning his blade red and gaining access to the transparent world in the process. It's touching to see how he thinks about him and Mitsuri as a team and thinks that he needs to hang in there and fight harder to make up for Mitsuri's absence. And he really does make up for her absence, since he's the first Hashira to get up after Muzan wrecks them and saves Tanjiro, even though he's lost his vision by this point and has to rely on Kaburamaru. By the way, how awesome is this snake? If you agree, you should smash that like button right now for Kaburamaru. After they defeat Muzan, we see Iguro holding Mitsuri. They are both dying from their wounds. Mitsuri apologizes for not being much use in this fight, but Iguro tells her to please not say that. He reminds her of the first time they met. Iguro says she was such a normal girl when they met and that saved him. She got excited over the smallest things and her laughter was like bells ringing. It was love at first sight pretty much. Iguro enjoyed talking to her and was happy feeling like a normal boy all the while. He says her bottomless cheerfulness and kindness saved many people, so she should be proud. Iguro would never let anyone say otherwise. And this is the part where I was probably bawling when reading, and even now my eyes are getting kind of watery, not gonna lie. Mitsuri cries too, saying she's so happy, and she cares about Iguro so much. This is her side of the confession here. She says meals always tasted best with him, because he looked at her with so much affection. She says, please Iguro, if we're reborn and we're humans, can I be your bride? And now, even this usually stoic dude is crying and he says yes of course, if you will agree to have me. It's one of, if not the sweetest moments in Demon Slayer. He continues saying this time I'll make you happy and protect you so you don't die. And they both pass away in each other's embrace, probably happier than they've ever been in their lives. Now if you don't know what happens, you might be like, Gozen, how's that a happy ending? They both died right when they were supposed to start their lives as an official couple. But remember what keeps being mentioned in their relationship arc, the idea of reincarnation and being together in that peaceful world. That actually comes to fruition in chapter 205 and it's my favorite part of that chapter. In this chapter we get a huge time skip and we see the descendants of those who survived the fight with Muzan and the reincarnations of those who lost their lives fighting him. We see the reincarnated versions of Mitsuri and Iguro on page 10 and it is so fulfilling and satisfying the perfect happy ending that they hoped for. They own a family diner together. They offer huge servings, a Mitsuri touch, and have snake decor, an Iguro touch. We even find out that Iguro, just like in his old life, got jealous when Yoshiteru, Zenitsu and Nezuko's descendant, wouldn't stop staring at Mitsuri's chest. So Iguro, now a cook, threw a knife at them. The thrown knife aside, we can imagine that they are a very happy married couple, and Mitsuri's reincarnation, just like in her past life, completely lights up the room with her smile. This romantic pairing had the most outwardly romantic moments in the series. While the others discussed seemed to stay more so in the background until the end, I feel like this one was very much in the foreground for these characters, if that makes sense. It never felt like an afterthought. Absolutely love them both individually and love them both together too. And after this video, I gotta say, this is at least tied for my favorite couple and maybe even is my favorite couple in all of Demon Slayer. Don't forget to let me know who your favorite Demon Slaying couple is in the comments. However, this next couple is not a Demon Slaying couple. Next up, we have Upper Moon 3, Akaza, X Koyuki. Akaza's backstory hits the hardest out of any demons for me. It's easy to hate the guy for taking the life of one of the best anime characters to ever exist, Kyojuro Rengoku. But Akaza's backstory makes him by far one of the most likable demons in the series, and a big part of that is due to his love story with a girl named Koyuki. When he was a human, Akaza went by the name Hakuji. His life was hard. As a kid, he only had his father and his father was sick. He needed medicine, but they were poor and couldn't afford it. Thus, rather than let his father die, Akaza stole, so he could bring back medicine. He was beaten up for it, he got three tattoos on his arms for getting caught three times, next time they would take his hand, they warned him, but he didn't care, he'd steal with his feet if he had to. Tragically, when he heard Hakuji got arrested, his father took his own life, not wanting to trouble his son. He thought this would help Hakuji live a righteous life. However, Hakuji saw it very differently. He never thought of his father as a burden or a bother, and would have taken any punishment gladly in order to help him. Hakuji was devastated when his father took his life. He was lost and got into more fights until he met the father of his love, Keizo, who owns a dojo. Hakuji tried to attack Keizo too when he showed up, but got his butt kicked. 
Not only did Keizo take him on as a student, he also trusted Hakuji to take care of his sick daughter, despite the fact that Hakuji had the tattoos of a criminal. When Hakuji meets daughter Koyuki, she reminds him of his sick father. In a sense, he has a chance to redeem himself by helping to save her in a way that he couldn't save his father. Hakuji was more than happy to stay up all night changing the towels on her forehead and her bedding. He gave her water and took her to the bathroom when she needed to go. He hated how sick people apologize for being an inconvenience because he knew that they'd love to do all these things for themselves if they could and they were the ones suffering the most. Crazy to think that the world viewed someone like him as a criminal and a demon child. But Keizo didn't, and because of Keizo's trust, Hakuji got a second chance. He didn't mind not being able to do other things and have fun, because as he says, he never thinks about fun in his free time, he just trains, so pay no mind, he tells Koyuki. She doesn't know it, but she gave Hakuji a new purpose when he thought that he had nothing to live for anymore. One day, she tells him that he should get away from his nursing responsibilities and go see the fireworks that will be launched that night. Hakuji refuses to go alone though, and says, that's right, and offers to carry her to the foot of the bridge so they could enjoy them together. He even says if she can't go today, then they can go next year or the year after that to enjoy them. This kindness made Koyuki cry, which in turn made Hakuji uncomfortable. During one conversation, Keizo tells Hakuji that they are the same in that they both need something to protect. And now Koyuki was clearly that something for Hakuji. Three years passed with Hakuji helping Koyuki. He was now 18 and she was 16. Now she was feeling a lot better. It seems Hakuji successfully nursed her back to health. She was up and around and able to live normally. What's more, Keizo told Hakuji that he wanted him to be his successor for the dojo since after all Koyuki liked him. So Hakuji went from losing everything and having nothing to being offered a dojo and Koyuki's hand in marriage. It's cute how Hakuji sweats and turns red as he hears this while Koyuki similarly blushes and looks down to avoid eye contact. Hakuji of course accepts the offer. He never thought someone like him could have a bright future, but now he's hopeful. He looks at the overjoyed Koyuki and smiling Keizo and thinks to himself that he would give his life to protect these two. We get a beautiful scene where finally Hakuji and Koyuki make it to see the fireworks. Hakuji was wondering if he's really good enough for Koyuki, and she reminds him that when she was a child, he spoke to her about going to see the fireworks. Those silly talks with him made her happy. She liked how he said they'd see the fireworks the year after or the year after that, if she couldn't make it that night. Before that, she couldn't imagine living into the next year. Her mother took her own life because she was the same way and didn't want to see her daughter die. She knew her father had given up as well because she was so terribly weak. But Hakuji could see her future as if it was a matter of fact and he talked to her about the next year and the year after that and she was very happy. She then grabs his hand and while blushing tells him yes he is good enough and asks him to marry her. He says yes, and says he will become stronger than anyone and protect her with his life. Meanwhile, the fireworks explode beautifully in the background. It's really the perfect night. But just as Hakuji gets a taste of his own personal heaven, it's ripped from him when the jealous rival dojo poisons their well. As a result, while Hakuji is away, visiting his father's grave, Keizo and Koyuki die from poisoning. After losing his father and everything that made his life worth living, slowly but surely he got on the right path again. His heart healed and he opened it up again only to lose it all once more. I don't think anyone can blame Hakuji for snapping here. He killed 67 members of the rival dojo with his bare hands. A surviving maid witnessed the carnage and lost her mind. The story was thought to be so crazy that after 30 years, the record of the event was disposed of as a fabrication, but it really did happen. Muzan heard about it and came to check on this demon sighting, only to find the human Hakuji covered in blood. It's not that Muzan turned Hakuji into a demon against his will, it's that Hakuji no longer had a reason to live in his view, and didn't care anymore about anything. Thus, Muzan was able to turn him into the demon Akaza. He lost his memories and began seeking power again. Notably though, there were remnants of his human life. For instance, he was the only demon moon to refuse to eat or kill women, despite the fact that women are especially nutritious for demons in the Demon Slayer world. This was even cited as being a possible reason for Akaza being weaker than Doma, despite the fact that he became a demon first. It goes to show that even as a demon with no memories, there were still some principles that he refused to betray for power. Furthermore, his compass needle technique forms the shape of a snowflake, a reference to his fiancée Koyuki, whose name contains the kanji for snow and who wore or snowflake shaped hairpins. Similarly, his attacks are named after fireworks, and as we've just seen, fireworks held a very special significance in the context of Hakuji and Koyuki's relationship. 
However, this love story doesn't end on a tragic note. Koyuki's spirit comes back to Akaza during his fight with Tanjiro and Giyu, and in fact, it's her influence that lets him overpower Muzan's influence. His spirit cries in her arms and begs for forgiveness as she welcomes her love home. With that reunion, his demon body is finally allowed to cease regenerating and disappear. Yorichi X Uta. Next, let's look at the strongest demon slayer in history's love story. Of course, I speak of Yorichi Tsukikuni, the man who created the original and strongest breath style, Sun Breathing. When he ran away as a kid from home, he eventually met a girl about his age called Uta. She was just standing there and not moving for a long time. So he asked what she was doing. She answered that her family died in a plague. She says she's all alone and very lonely. So she came there to find some tadpoles to take home. But she freed the tadpoles saying she felt sorry about separating them from their families. The young Yorichi says they'll accompany her home and she looks at him and cries. They decide to live together. Uta would talk from morning to night and thanks to her, Yorichi learned how to see the world in different ways. Yorichi describes their relationship this way. He says he was always like a kite whose string had been broken, but Uta held onto his hand firmly. Ten years later, they got married and they got pregnant. Eventually, it was time for Yorichi to get a midwife, so he set out for one. He planned to return before the sun set, but he ended up helping an old man along the way. Even though he headed home right after that, and planned to summon the midwife tomorrow because he was running late, night fell before he arrived. When he arrived, both Uta and their unborn child had been killed. As Yorichi tells Sumiyoshi, Tanjo's ancestor, another person may not hesitate to trample upon someone whose life you value more than your own. For 10 days, Yorichi was in a daze as he cradled their bodies. Eventually, an ancestor of Kyojuro's, a swordsman in pursuit of a demon, showed up and saw the scene. He encouraged Yorichi to mourn them properly through prayer. As Yorichi explains, his dream was to live a quiet life with his family in a small house where they would sleep side by side. He would be close enough to see the faces of his beloved wife and child, and close enough to reach out and take their hands. That would have been enough for him, even if he was the greatest swordsman to ever exist. And I really like how Demon Slayer questions whether ambition or being the best is important as both Yorichi and Tanjiro are the type to be satisfied by simple, peaceful lives. That is the perfect happy ending for Tanjiro, it just so happens that he needs to get strong to reach that ending. While people who are obsessed with being the best for its own sake, like Yorichi's brother Kokushibo, end up trading their souls for it and still don't reach their goal. But back to Yorichi's backstory, and you can see why after his wife and child were killed by a demon, he would decide to turn his attention to eradicating demons, since he didn't want anyone else to go through what he had. Tengen X his three wives. Then of course, there's the sound Hashira, Tengen Uzui, and his three wives, Makio, Suma, and Hinatsuru. Although you might want to hate on Tengen for having three wives like Zainzu and Yutaro do, I actually like how Demon Slayer has an open mind with this four-way romance. It wasn't even Tengen's choice to begin with. In the first fan book, Tengen's ninja family's practice of polygamy is explained. At 15, a boy must have three wives. The head of the clan will choose the wives, and they do take chemistry into account when picking. Furthermore, Tengen clearly cares deeply about his wives, as he tells them to always think about their lives first. He says they are more important than any mission. He doesn't care what they have to leave behind just to make sure to return to him. That positions Tengen in a very positive light when compared to his father's brutal ninja ways. Even Tengen tells them that his ways may sound strange given their profession, but that's how he wants it. He tells them they three come first, then reliable assistants, and then Tengen himself. So you gotta respect how he puts each and every one of them above himself. He lets them know that they are the most important thing to him, so they can't let themselves get killed. He also pats them on the head and compliments them, which is nice, and completely different from what they've been taught to expect as female ninjas. Bonus points if you know the Japanese term for female ninjas, just write down in the comments. Tengen's care and kindness are reciprocated by his wives, who always want to help him and are visibly devastated when they see the dire situation he is in after the Gyutaro fight. And I like the way each of his wives is different, but they all love him in their own way. For instance, when he had the habit of saying he'd go to hell, it upsets all his wives so much that he stopped saying it. But what's interesting is that they all responded differently when he used to say it. Makio got angry, Hinatsuru cried, and Suma bit him. That biting part specifically gets me every time. After this battle, as the four discussed before, Beforehand, they retire from demon slaying, which is fair because they did their part. 
I like that not everyone needs to fight to the death. They got different paths. Besides, Tengen would obviously be less useful anyway after losing his arm and eye. Yes, Tengen helps here and there with training or protection, but nothing as dangerous as he did before, and I'm sure his wives are relieved about that. Notably, the once friendless Giyu befriends Tengen and his family after the final battle with Muzon. We're even told in the second fanbook that when Tengen's child was born, Giyu was allowed to hold the baby. But which one of the three wives gave gave birth to the child, I couldn't tell you. Either way, I'm sure they all rejoiced and teamed up to raise the ninja baby together. Sanami x Kanae Yes, always angry bad boy Sanami actually had a soft spot for a girl, specifically for Shinobu's older sister Kanae, who was the flower Hashira before Upper Moon 2 Doma took her life. In the second fan book, Gyome pretty much reveals who every Hashira likes, and when it comes to Sanami, he says, and I quote, he seems to like Kanae. End quote. Sanami himself says he talks to Shinobu now and then since she's Kana's little sister. After Kana's death, whenever they meet, he asks Shinobu if she's doing okay. Doesn't sound like the Sanami we get in the anime, but it makes sense when you consider this is the little sister of the woman he loved. Even in the alternate universe of Kimetsu Academy, where Sanami is a math teacher, he talks to Kana frequently, showing in a way that their love transcends universes. Tamayo x Yushiro. Now, this is more of a one sided romance, but that one side is so devoted that it must be mentioned. Tamayo never got over the loss of her husband and children, so I don't think she could ever romantically open up after that. However, after she saved Yushiro from an illness by turning him into a demon, she let him become her personal assistant. He was so in love and obsessed with her that he would be very overprotective of her, to the point where it even bothered him when Nezuko hugged her. When he senses Tamayo's death, Yushiro's enraged expression on page 17 of chapter 180 says it all. To say that she was the most important person in his life would be an understatement. But what's most admirable about this one-sided romance is just how undying Yushiro's love is. Demon Yushiro survived into the modern day as we see during chapter 205 which on a side note interestingly proves that demons can survive even if the demon that turned them passes away. So if they wanted to do a sequel, they could definitely make it so that surviving demons pop up here and there. Just saying. But back to the modern day, and Yushiro is now a mysterious artist who has not only never moved on from Tamayo, but now paints picture after picture of Tamayo. His work is even beginning to receive critical acclaim. Zenitsu's descendant comments that his favorite is number 812, meaning there could well be a thousand or more more paintings of Tamayo by now and counting. So even though it may be sad that Yushiro's love was never requited, it's beautiful how untainted and undying his love is after centuries. It was one of my favorite details about the time skip and final chapter. Giyu x Shinobu, we're finally here. Now this is one of the most popular ships in the Demon Slayer fandom, but is it canon or just fans pushing them together? Let's look at the evidence. In the anime, the two are fairly close, at least as close as anyone could be to Loner Giyu at this point. Yes, there was the whole Shinobu's heel blade, almost stabbing Giyu in the face thing, but notably she's the one who defends Giyu in front of the Hashira after Giyu breaks the rules. Iguro is out for blood as mentioned, while Shinobu says we needn't worry about him. He came along without a fight. So even though Shinobu sometimes teases Giyu to his face, she actually defends him in front of others. Fans have also picked up on when Shinobu said isn't the moon love lovely in the anime, and Giyu agreed. Isn't the moon lovely is said to be a poetic way to say I love you in Japanese. If that's not enough ammo for shippers, Shinobu is also in Giyu's spin-off in the stories of Water and Flame volume. After she joins him on his mission, the two eat together and Giyu even cracks a smile in her presence, which I hope I don't need to tell you is exceedingly rare for Giyu. Iguro and Mitsuri, who also loved each other, would eat like this together as well. Then, as I mentioned, there is what Gyome said in the second fanbook. He said Shinobu seems to enjoy talking with Giyu, and that Giyu seems happy talking with Shinobu. For her part, Shinobu said she thinks Giyu should talk a bit more, implying that she'd like him to open up to her more, while Giyu comments that Shinobu talks to him often. He says she's earnest and hardworking, and that she looks unwell at times. This last line arguably shows that he worries about her. Lastly, the usually stoic Giyu is visibly affected by the news that Shinobu is dead during chapter 144, albeit he doesn't cry like Tanjiro does. So although they don't get together in the end, it's not difficult to believe that they would have if Shinobu's life wasn't tragically cut short because of demons. And that is it for every secret romance in Demon Slayer in my longest video on YouTube. If you appreciate the amount of work and time that went into this, please smash that like button to let me know until you see fireworks. 
Akaza X Koyuki style, and of course subscribe, but that's far from all the secrets in the series. If you like learning about the Demon Slayer secrets from fun to straight up shocking, then you don't want to miss my 101 Demon Slayer secrets you didn't know video, link on screen right now in the description. See you there.